everyone. Welcome to our panel, um, which is on DIDs and ongoing conversation. Uh, my name is Lauren Feld. I'm the head of growth at Three Box Labs, which is the team behind Ceramic Network, um, which is a network for sovereign data. Before we kick off today, I just wanted to get a sense of the audience and who we have. So if you guys in the audience, if you've heard of DIDs, can you just give like a little round of applause if you've heard of it? Okay. All right, all right. Uh, and now give a little round of applause if you've heard of DIDs and you know what they are. Okay. Slightly less. Um, so awesome, that's, uh, that's what we're here for. Does anyone want to shout out what a DID is? What does that stand for? All right, so DID is a decentralized identifier and that's what we're gonna be talking about for the next 30 minutes. Um, not only what they are, how they're being used today in the industry, but also how they came about and how we see them evolving. So to start, I'll just do some quick intros of our awesome panelists. So first we have Wang Cheng, who's the co-founder and CEO of Spruce Systems, which is an open source Y Combinator backed startup focusing on decentralized identity and decentralized data storage. Uh, and then we have Pele at the end, who's the CEO of Nota Bene, which is another identity project helping centralized exchanges uh, deal with regulations using DIDs and verifiable credentials, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and lastly, we have Oliver Turbu in the middle, um, who is a architect and standards lead at Consensus Identity. Um, and both Oliver and Pele were part of the Uport team, which was one of the first decentralized identity projects in the Ethereum space. Um, and all three of our panelists have spent time working with the W3C, the OpenID Foundation, the Decentralized Identity Foundation on creating these open standards. So I think we're in very good hands today. So to kick it off, I'd love to just hear from you guys. Everyone talks about identity. It's a super nebulous term. What does it mean and, and why is it so important? Well, I identity is definitely not easy to define. And identity is not a, just a specific thing. Identity is something about us and how we present ourselves. So there's a lot of philosophical ways of defining identity. And it's often difficult because as engineers, we tend to want identity being a technical protocol or a ENS name or a email address or something like that. But that's not an identi identity. These are identifiers. And we all have many different identifiers. A lot part of our identity is not related to an identifier, but it's related to how we present ourselves in daily life, online, etc. Yeah, I agree with Pella. So I also think that there won't be one single identifier that will define ourselves. I think we will have multiple different identifiers in different contexts. Um, for instance, I want to present a different identifier or identity in my um, professional uh, work um, and also want to separate this from other contexts that you, I mean, basically situations like. Uh, I don't know, family, banking, gambling, whatever it is, it is, I think it's very important to separate those. And an identifier is really just, it's not identity, an identifier is really something that can accrue reputation uh, in a certain context. And maybe, Wayne, before you go, if we can just talk about how do you guys see identity being different in Web 2 versus Web 3? Yeah, so um, to address the first question, what is identity? Um, <clears throat> the ISO definition would have you believe that it's a set of attributes associated with an entity. I think that's too narrow and just like what Pele was saying, you know, too engineering focused. I like the definition that identity is the way that we recognize, remember, and react to people and things. It's extremely contextual, just like Oliver said. You have a different identity you want to present in different circumstances, and you don't necessarily want to present all your data at once, all the time, like perhaps on a public blockchain. But uh, in Web3, we have the opportunity to start from identifiers that are completely detached from any other information and gradually build up your information with your consent for a specific interaction, right? And that is an awesome, awesome privacy model that is possible when we have uh, cryptographically based identifiers uh, and we don't start with an email that you're already highly correlated with. And I'm really excited for that potential. Cool. I think everyone here has kind of started to hit on DIDs, but maybe we can just break it down and talk specifically about what is a decentralized identifier? Where did it come from? Like how did it come about and why was it so novel? 
so, so decentralized identifiers is a way of, or it's a proposal to, to create a set of standards allowing people to start iterating of, on essentially user issued identity. And a decentralized identifier is just a, a very simple technical spec. Um, actually, it's an extremely simple technical spec where you can go in and just have an identifier and that identifier could be a blockchain address, it could be an Ethereum address, or it could be an ENS name, something else, but it's just an identifier. And the but it's a way of look, you can look up information about this identif identifier. So you can look up public keys. So an ident decentralized identifier, it can, it can actually sign things. So you can, you can, see things that are signed by uh, an identifier. You can also receive information. So it's something that represents a part of you. And it's simply a blockchain address can very easily be used as a decentralized identifier. Yeah, so it's a, so a DID, a decentralized identifier is a, um, yeah, it's a W3C standard. I mean, it's about to become a official global standard. I mean, currently we are about to um, reach the recommendation stage. And yeah, so a, a DID is really nothing else than a data model for any kind of decentralized identifier. So ENS could be also seen as a form of a decentralized identifier. I, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote a spec that actually tries to um, reformat or like put um, ENS names in the format of a decentralized identifier so you can use it um, with did like did based systems, and I think that's very important. If we agree that this will be like the unified format for things like that, then we would all benefit from it because it would increase interoperability. We would, especially between um, systems that have been built in the last couple of years in a decentralized identity space, and um, the emerging stuff that happens in the Ethereum space. Really quick, Wayne, before you go, I know you mentioned W3C, I mentioned in the beginning, but we're throwing around a lot of acronyms. Does someone just want to break down what is that so, for the audience? Yeah, so W3C is the World Wide Web Consortium, standardized HTML, CSS, um, the next data formats that have been standardized. Verifiable credentials was standardized in 2019. How do we sign a digital attestation about something? Uh, it's not just restricted to the Web3 world, but verifiable credentials is likely the global data standard that your digital diplomas are gonna be represented in. Professional certificates, vaccine credentials, how do we do this in a privacy preserving way? You know, that's kinda what we're all trying to think about. And to decentralize identifiers, I think to contextualize it, it's very helpful to think about what's the problem that decentralized identifiers uh, try to solve, right? And that problem is, what if Google rugs you? What if you lose your at Gmail account? And um, how much access do you lose? It's not just Google sites, right? It's anything you ever use that identifier to log into, it's kind of gone if a centralized identity provider decides not to serve your account anymore, right? So um, what are user controlled alternatives so we can transition not your keys, not your coins over to not your keys, not your identifier? How do we build one that you control? Decentralized identifiers give us a potential pathway there, and that's why it's, it's exciting. Awesome. Maybe Wayne, while you have the mic, do you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the use cases for DIDs? I know you guys are doing a lot of work around them. Just share a little bit about what we're seeing out there. Yeah, so especially relevant to people here is cross-chain identity. How can we refer to blockchain accounts on different blockchains make references to other blockchains. If you're on Ethereum saying on this other EVM chain, you know, that's the same account as my previous one. If uh, there's even a non-EVM chain, how can you make claims, statements about that other account? Maybe you're a very successful farmer on Ethereum and you want to show people that, you know, you're a successful farmer so you should give me better APY on another chain, right? Decentralized identifiers can be a way that you have handles across these different chains to be able to assert yourself. Even in the metaverse with gaming use cases, how do you, you know, take your experience items from one game to another game so that it travels with you, not locked into a service? That's really the ethos of Web3 and decentralized identifiers are very aligned to that. 
Yeah, so in the pure technical sense, the use cases of DIDs are, I think, um, discovery of public key information and service endpoints. So you can give someone your DID and then that person can uh, resolve um, information that allows, you, allows the person to verify signatures generated from the DID controller or even uh, encrypt data to the DID controller. You would also be able to discover certain services of the user. And so ultimately, DIDs gives you the ability to prove control over that identifier, which can then be used together with verifiable credentials, which are more important to you know, reputation use cases. So verifiable credentials is actually uh, more important for encoding um, that kind of data. So for instance, if you, if you attend an event like this, you would get a credential um, issued to a, your identifier and then in, Later on, you can actually prove that you control um, that credential so you can um, show someone you really attended the event. Yeah, I think, I think one of the real important use cases as we're moving everything onto public blockchains is that verifiable credentials and DIDs allows us to start building a way of talking about, of associating off-chain information such as who we are, what we do off in an off-chain way, in a privacy-preserving way, and we can associate this to our blockchain data, and whether it's across blockchains or not. And that's a really important part of it, particularly because, you know, in the Ethereum world, we, we, we often, everything we do lives within this, you know, beautiful, giant, shared EVM. But we also need to get the benefit of the EVM outside, we need to tie things to the outside world. And this is really where the verifiable credentials and DIDs come in. And it's a really, really important part of what the technology allows us to do. If I can just respond to that. Yeah, yeah totally agreed. So one of my favorite use case examples is, you know, the, the holy grail of a lot of Web3 networks, decentralized Uber. What if instead of Uber taking a 25% VIG on every transaction, right, you just pay the cost of computation to the protocol, you're matched up and you're good to go. There are problems with this model, right? Namely, you don't want to get into a stranger's car just because they pulled up after you send a transaction to a smart contract address. For the next 20 minutes of your life or so, you want to know that you're going to be okay, right? And maybe you don't trust claims exclusively from other Ethereum addresses to tell you you're going to be okay. You actually want the Department of Motor Vehicles or an insurance company to be like, yeah, that person's like, you know, they have a clean driving record, they paid their insurance, and they're, they're good, and they have reputation on the network. Those systems are based on like cryptographic systems invented in the 80s, like X509 and other like older systems. And if you hope to associate some of that data to a blockchain address, you're going to need interoperability, you're going to need DIDs, you're going to need VCs, just like Peli was saying. Awesome. So yeah, we're, we're dropping a lot of different terms, DIDs, VCs. Maybe we can just break down verifiable credentials a little further and kind of compare contrast with DIDs uh, and talk about the trade-offs. Yeah, uh, I'll start it off and keep it short, but a verifiable credential is just signed JSON that has structure. Uh, there are some other nuances and required fields to it, like who's making this statement, but you can think of a verifiable credential as a digital statement about reality, right? And it's kind of up to your so-called trust framework or shared belief on how people interpret that, the right data schemas to use and things like that. Decentralized identifiers and uh, verifiable credentials don't need each other, but they work well together. Uh, verifiable credentials can completely work with an HTTPS Web 2 based system, that's fine. Uh, but if you have a decentralized identifier, you can use verifiable credentials to show that, uh, to make statements with your DID. So, um, and I'll hand it over to Oliver who might be able to talk about how you might issue a verifiable credential out of MetaMask. Yeah, so the, the verifiable credential specification under in WS3C, um, so it's already a global final standard, um, so it's adopted by WS3C and a lot of people are billing on top of it. And uh, so the data model specification is super, super flexible. Uh, it allows you to um, attach any form of proof um, to secure the, the JSON blob or the JSON LD blob to be more specific. And because this proof, um, you know, is so flexible, um, you can even use your MetaMask or your EAP712 signature to um, issue verifiable credentials through MetaMask. 
So we currently, so we have, um, we have been working on a specification actually recently that would allow to do that. Yeah, it's, it's really important to understand that mo in most cases, verifiable credential is not designed to be able to be used on chain, but there are these use cases where you can do it. So what, what, what Oliver was just talking about. So there, there's some interesting use cases there that I think are particularly in good for, for, uh, for Ethereum, where you could essentially issue a certificate of some real world aspect to your MetaMask wallet. And then you could use that when you're calling a, a smart contract. And then essentially, then the smart contract, instead of checking a white list, for example, it can get real time information from the real world. And you just tag that along as a token along with a smart contract call. And it's a really, really flexible way of, of tying the real world to the two, the, two smart contracts. But, but it is really important, and I think a very important thing for us in the Ethereum world to, it, when we're talking about identities and identifiers, if, we all, if we're talking about a single global identifier, which is what a lot of people use on Ethereum, you know, you need to start being very careful about what you put on the blockchain itself. But it allows us to do that, put essentially very data minimized claims that you can put on a blockchain. Yeah, so we're talking about a lot of the benefits around DIDs. I want to maybe go into some of the limitations. So, for example, some people will argue that DIDs are actually re-centralizing user data. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on that and maybe some other limitations around DIDs? Yeah, so I think that it's important to remember that DIDs are just a data format specification. It's just an identifier, right? Like a, and it doesn't really try to centralize data or decentralize it for that matter. It opens up a lot of possibility though. Um, so the, the risk that a lot of people are pointing out is correlation risk, which is a very important risk to, for us to understand, right? And correlation risk is people being able to behind your back or you know, maybe in front of you, look at all your information, figure out um, what interactions might also be you and get a fuller picture of who you are and uh, maybe violate your privacy. My favorite definition of privacy, just to start with there, is from Helen Nissenbaum. It's um, privacy is being able to maintain appropriate flows of information, right? So you might want to be very public about it, you might not want to be, but that's the point. It's up to the user. Privacy is not the same as confidentiality, right? So in order, so a lot of the design goals should, and this is probably a value that we all share, should enshrine user privacy and uh, figure out for the demographic what's appropriate, flows of information for them and get them there. Uh, and I think that um, if you're not careful about making this consideration, you might end up building a system that correlates everyone's data and reveals more information about them than they anticipated and that's a horrible outcome. And Oliver, maybe before you go, um, you know, another limitation that people are talking about is around all the different DID methods that are out there and that that's kind of leading to, again, a fragmentation rather than a unification around standards. Um, I know you've co-authored a bunch of DID methods, so maybe you could talk a little bit about why that is, like the need for having these different methods and maybe give some examples of some of the ones that you've co-authored. Uh, yeah, so the, as, as Wayne um, already mentioned earlier, um, so the DID specification is really just a data model specification and it's designed the way that you can come up with your own specific um, so-called DID method. A DID method defines the crude operations for um, stuff that is in the DID um, document, um, so in the data model, how to modify the data model, how to update the keys who are authoritative um, to the DID and the controller and owner and stuff at service endpoints. And so they're like, how many 100 plus uh, DID methods already registered? Um, some people might argue that's bad, but it's actually good because it shows the flexibility of the DID spec. So you can really literally um, write um, a DID method specification for all kind of use cases. So we, there's even um, DID methods for um, that wrap Ethereum accounts, uh, that wrap NFTs, assets, and uh, also ENS names. And certainly there are DID methods that do work on-chain and off-chain. Layer 2 is also possible, so there are actually not so many limitations. 
maybe Pele, I know that you are dying to talk about ENS, um, so maybe we can open the floor for that now. I, I know yesterday Makoto was presenting and talking about um, sign-in with ENS that they're launching, and mm. ENS is also emerging as kind of this other identity kind of standard out there. What, what are your thoughts on that? Where does that fit right. into this conversation? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of ENS, but there is a very big problem with the way that the Ethereum community is using ENS at the moment. It's become a cool thing for you to have an ENS name as on your Twitter profile. And ENS is not designed, it's not a good thing to encourage people to use it as an identifier for people. Be and the reason for this being is that you are essentially creating in Web3 something sim as similarly dangerous as what we got through Web2. You're creating a public source of data that everyone out there can go in and, and, and analyze and do graph analysis on that's tied to individuals. So I, I'm a big fan of, again, of ENS for businesses, services, smart contracts, all of those kinds of things. But when you use it and when you're encouraging particularly new crypto users, new blockchain users who don't understand how blockchains work to use ENS, it is a really irresponsible thing for us to do as a community. And ENS is great, and there are ENS dead methods and everything, and ENS has absolutely has its place. But as a community, as an Ethereum community, we need to take some responsibility here and not create the next Facebook just in a decentralized way, because that's what we're literally doing at the moment. And we have to stop this now. Do you want to respond maybe? Yeah. So um, I'm going to also add to that uh, discussion so um, at Spruce, we're working on signing with Ethereum, with ENS and the Ethereum Foundation. How do we have uh, one way to sign in with your Ethereum address? Uh, you can go to login.xyz if you want to learn more or see notes. But basically, the gist is, you know, um, we want to be able to let the user um, sign in with Ethereum as opposed to signing with Google, signing with Facebook. And what Pele is mentioning is a very important problem in that your ENS domain and all their data about your account can instantly be resolved once you do this. That's that correlation risk we're talking about and I think the demographic he brings up is basically the most vulnerable demographic. New users who don't understand the implications of their actions. It's all about use case. It's all about user expectations and if those expectations of how their data are used are met or not, right? So if a new user, you know, buys a NFT and puts it as their Twitter profile picture and doxes themselves, links their Twitter account to their address, right? They might have had the expectation that, oh, no one can do that. I'm just showing my PFP. But uh, hey, um, their expectations were violated, right? So I think what Pele is saying, we have to do a better job as an ecosystem to educate the different trade offs. We're already starting to see some uh, of this take root where a lot of people are having a public presence account <coughs> that you're okay, you know, sharing to everyone else. Everything in that account is public and associated to a real identity. You might have other accounts that you use more privately that you don't expect people to know about and you have to take extra precautions to achieve that privacy. So the UX for that isn't great right now and there's a lot of work we need to do to improve on that. But I think it's critical if we want to protect new users, especially as mainstream adoption happens, to prevent a privacy catastrophe. So I agree largely. Maybe just a quick aside because you're talking about NFTs and bringing Web2 users along. Um, so a lot of people are talking about using NFTs to add reputation and semantic context to DIDs. What do you guys think of that? Is that kind of just building off of the NFT hype? Is it solving a real problem? Yeah, so I think that you should always consider uh, maybe not doing an NFT for data around a user, right? Uh, I think that's a safe assumption. Uh, think about if you had the information in hand, where are the places that you would want to present that information, that the user would want to present it. Because as soon as you put it as an NFT, it's kind of out there forever and always if you believe in the longevity of blockchains, right? So that's a very important consideration to take. Uh, your, your first reaction should not be, let's grab an NFT for that to represent data about a user. Uh, definitely not personally identifiable information. Uh, that, that is just, uh, don't do that. Yeah, I think for many use cases, um, so currently there are a lot of pull-ups. I also received a pull-up today um, for attending this conference. Uh, I think a lot of those reputational use cases 
I think it's really not important um, to always show that um, you own that on chain. I think in mo many cases it's just okay to present those uh, that reputation completely off chain, and for those use cases, verifiable credentials make total sense. Um, I mean, I have, you know, I do like NFTs for certain things, but is it really a, the best choice for, you know, um, representing your identity? I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of privacy issues um, that I can think of. I think, I mean, it's totally possible today to create an uh, NFT where the owner of the NFT is like a specific ENS name, like a sticky, evil, malicious NFT. And then you would have that, uh, it's basically like bad reputation that you would have forever. Um, I mean, problems like that appeared on Facebook a long time ago where people got mobbed by other users. And with, F with NFTs, you would have something like that forever on chain. And that, I think that's a risk um, people would need to consider. So um, again, I'm not against NFTs. I do like them, but um, uh, we need to take care that there's some privacy implications. Maybe Pele, just to switch the topic, I'm looking at time. One thing that I think is important that we'll cover is just your thoughts on whether Ethereum wallets will in the future support DIDs and verifiable credentials. And just talking about, you know, does that open up any new use cases? What does that look like if they were to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important for the Ethereum community to start adopting this technology because it, it really allows us to, to build, for example, build tokens, DeFi protocols, whatever kind of things that we want to build on Ethereum, but actually tie it to the real world. And it's not always an easy, straightforward way of thinking about it, but we're building this new technology, just like it's, you know, when people were starting building DeFi protocols, there's a lot of learning, a lot of mistakes to be made, right? And that's the same also, now we're trying to tie these to the real world. And there's a lot of in really incredible opportunities out there. Um, like we, we are using DIDs at my company every day for, for enabling crypto transactions for between regulated entities. And it's a great way for entities to be able to communicate between each other and, and make sense of a particular transaction. So that's a real world use case that we're using it for today. And there are lots of other interesting things happening. Like the European Union is rolling out, uh, this guy's involved with it, uh, rolling out, uh, DIDs and verifiable credentials as new identity methods within the European Union. Yeah. Maybe, I'm just looking, 30 seconds left. If each of you guys just want to give a 10 second, what will we be saying about DIDs a year from now? Um, my hope is actually that um, DIDs will eventually be adopted by um, crypto wallets, Ethereum wallets, and would um, actually be used for cross-chain identification. Um, that's my hope. It will also require um, wallet providers to um, add support for that. Yeah, um, our perspective is that uh, we should just try harder to meet the community where they're at. And um, you know, if you already have an Ethereum address, well, check under your seat. You have a did, you know, and um, go from there and uh, work out signature suites that work with the signing that we're familiar with in Ethereum. So I think that will demonstrate. Uh, some really great utility to the ecosystem right away and we'll be able to adopt even more sophisticated forms of identity with uh, better features. We need lots of dits. Everyone should have hundreds of thousands of dits out there and I think that's what we're going to see in the future. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining me up here. Thanks you guys for listening in the audience. Sorry we don't have time for questions. Come find any of the panelists uh, if you want to chat after.